When you're thinking about entering or beginning to think about learning about any particular field, I think it's important to, to think about where does this information come from? How do we know what works and what doesn't work in this and in this field? And, and, and what is that knowledge, that collective knowledge over the years? And, and really all of that comes from theory, the, the idea of putting ideas together and, and saying, you know, this is what we think to be true. And we, and we've tested this and we've had some success and, and seeing this work in reality, but, uh, so it's not fact, but it's theory. So I want to talk a little bit in this video about communication theory, some basic communication theories and public relations, how these intersect with public relations. So first to be very clear about what a theory is, theory is a plausible or scientifically acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain phenomena up or it could also be defined as a hypothesis assumed for the sake of argument or investigation. So let's differentiate first of all, between theory and fact. Fact is something we know to be true. It's, it's concrete. It's, it's objectively true. No matter what theory is not quite there. Theory is something that we've studied. We think is, is generally true and leads us to different conclusions, but isn't necessarily going to work the same in every, every situation. And, uh, it won't always work out in general. So, so theory is something we can say, look, we think based on our experience and knowledge, this is going to work, or this is what happens in this situation but it's not a fact yet. It's a theory, right? So, um, so we think that's what's going to happen. We can't always guarantee that's what's going to happen. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some basic communication theories, some, some, um, generally accepted communication theories that often intersect with public relations, the area of public relations. So, uh, the first one is agenda setting theory. This is a huge one for public relations in terms of understanding the principles of, of how we communicate with an audience and how they attain information and what impact we have and, and, uh, and processing that information and things. So, um, agenda setting theory was put forth by McCombs and Shaw, famously by McCombs and Shaw, who basically said then that, um, that there's reality, right? The, there's what happens in a given situation. And, and then there's the person's perception of that reality which is going to be different for each individual. So that's an important um, distinction. First of all, that there's what actually happened. There's objectively what happened. And then there's what that person perceives as reality based on their own frame of reference, based on their own values and beliefs and education and understanding and experiences in the world and so forth. Uh, all of that goes into shaping their perception of that reality. So first of all, everybody's going to have their own slightly different perception of that reality. But then you also throw in Oftentimes we don't actually see the things that happen. We're not actually experiencing them firsthand. We depend on others to tell us about them. Um, so when that happens, the other person then or, or organization has the opportunity to set the agenda, what we would call the agenda. And so we're not perceiving that reality based on what our own firsthand experiences are, but what we're, we're receiving through these different outlets. And that outlet could be another person. It could be the TV news. It could be social media. It could be, um, <clears throat> just any way that we gather information. But here we're going to focus mostly on the role of the media as we, as we perceive it here in agenda setting theory. So McCombs and Shaw said there are basically two levels of agenda setting. The first level of agenda setting, um, says uh, the, the media kind of determines and, and whatever, you know, whatever agency you're using to gather that information, whether it's, whether it's a news organization, whether it's a social media account or whatever, that person or that organization has the opportunity to decide what stories get told in the first place. What stories make it on the news and which ones don't, which stories make it onto somebody's social media feed and which ones don't. It's highly cultivated, right? It's highly, it's highly controlled and cultivated by the organization or the individual that's making that decision. So the first level of agenda setting that identifies, okay, what stories get told and which ones get left out. That's important to our perception of reality, right? To what actually is happening in the world, because if we don't know as much about an issue or about, about a circumstance, then we're not likely to have as, as deep a perception of that or an accurate perception of that. Right? So what stories are getting told, told in the first place? Then there's also the second level of agenda setting. After we determine which stories are getting told, then that person or that organization is able to identify, okay, how is the story going to be shaped? How are we going to tell the story? What details are we going to provide? What language are we going to use in describing that story and, uh, and, and that, that situation? Um, and so the organization or the individual then shapes the story through the second level of agenda setting by identifying those things and making those choices. All of that then impacts how that person perceives that reality. 
first of all, what they know about that, you know, what they're knowing, what they're hearing about, what they're not, um, and then how they're hearing about it, how is it being shaped and formed as they receive that information. So um, that's really the, the basic idea behind agenda setting is this idea that not only, first of all, do we not always experience things firsthand, so it goes through some other, some third party, right? But, uh, but then that third party has a role in agenda setting that determines, first of all, what stories you're getting told and then how they're being framed, how they're being told. Speaking of that, speaking of that second level of agenda setting, it really leads into our next uh, area, which is what we call framing theory. Framing theory was put forth by Irving Gothman. Okay, and framing theory basically says, okay, in, in any time somebody's communicating something, um, there's the frame. There's the frame that's how it's being told, how it's being explained, how it's being expressed, what language is being used, what images are being used, and so forth. How is that person or that organization framing that story? How are they um, explaining it? How are they describing it? What spin are they putting on it? How are they shaping it? So one, one little example we can look at here is we can take a look at this picture that's in the frame, right? This picture that's in the frame. It's a little grainy, sorry, but this picture is in the frame. And what do we see is happening here? We see, um, based on the, the what I'm showing you here, what's in the frame? that one person is stabbing another, the person on the left seems to be stabbing the person on the right, right? But if we zoomed out, okay, this is one, one potential way to frame it. But if we zoomed out and we saw what's actually happening here, we would see that the opposite is true, but we're just not seeing what's out of the frame. I'm framing my uh, my video here by by shaping this. This I have a green screen behind me. You know, I love books and I have a bookshelf actually behind me, but this is a, this is a green screen bookshelf behind me right now. So I'm framing what you see. You don't see what else is going on in the house. You don't see what's going on below here, below like, you know, shoulder level. You don't, you don't, you don't know what I'm wearing. I could be wearing my pajamas underneath this, this shirt. So, um, but it's what I'm framing, what I'm allowing you to see. And that's true for every circumstance, right? In, in life that we have this, this frame and a frame can be uh, used or, and, and created using any rhetorical uh, device. Right. Any rhetorical device that we can use to influence meaning could be part of that framing. So um, our words, the imagery that we use, the sound, the motion, all of this goes into um, framing and, and shaping how we view a particular situation or particular instance. So again, very much connected to that agenda setting thing, agenda setting theory, especially the, the second level of agenda setting is is essentially framing but you know really important to remember that uh, that we have a role to play in that on both sides as as a as a practitioner we have a role to play in how we shape this and how we frame this and also on the flip side as a receiver of this information we have to be aware that somebody is framing this and it's coming from somewhere in somebody else's perspective uh, the next area i'd like to look at is called two-step flow brought to us by uh, lazarus feld and cats okay. two-step flow um, has to do with how um, information is um, not only communicated, but the steps that it goes through and, and again, kind of how we, how we receive this information and how it's spread and, uh, and that there are, there are essentially as according to this theory by Lazarus, Feld and Katz, there are two steps, right? So if we think of this like a, like a, like a pyramid or like almost like a funnel, really, um, except in this instance, it's, it's upside down. It's, it's more like a megaphone right? coming from the top down. Um, so the air, the, the information is flowing from that top down. Lazarus Feld and Katz said in this two-step flow that the, first of all, we have the media yeah. um, the media and, and they have an, um, a message that they want to convey and a story that they want to get out and, and, uh, and potentially, you know, somebody else like, a, like a PR practitioner doing that, they might communicate and, and focus their efforts on what we would call key influencers, people who really can reach a lot of people. And, and this term has taken on almost a whole new meaning now in the, in the era of social media, where we actually have influencers, where organizations are reaching out to these, these few people with these massive followings, right? And they say, well, we don't need to reach necessarily every person in the world. We need to reach these couple people and have them speak on our behalf. And then that message will spread through them, right? And we'll spread out and we'll eventually get to the general public with the message that we want to convey. So, uh, so we don't have to convey this message to every single person and sell it to every single person. We just need to identify who are the key um, influencers that can reach that audience for us, to reach that public for us. And then they can help us spread that message to the general public. Now, it also works in reverse in what we call upward flow. We still have the same kind of, you know, triangle, except this time we're going to go up the ladder. So this is how you get, a, you know, an impact through a, an, a, an action group or, or um, 
or through a um, a group that wants to um, to to really uh, sell uh, uh, some powerful people on something, you would have this the, going the opposite direction. You would have this directed group, uh, so a specific you know, community action group or um, or, or, or industry um, uh, industry representatives that are that are trying to sell this idea or protect something about that industry, whatever. Some some committed, really focused, directed group for a particular issue or concern. And then the would would do the opposite. They would contact key influencers who could then reach these these specific decision makers, right? So you see this a lot in the lobbying effort, for example, in the government. So you'll have a group uh, that'll that'll say, okay, um, you know, we want to this you know, state gun control or or gun regulation as an example on either side. Both sides have lobbyists, you know. So take your pick whether you're you're uh, for gun control or you're you're against you know gun regulation and so forth. Doesn't matter. Pick your side. Either one of those would be a directed group, and then they would contact key influencers, people who have the ear of specific uh, people in government who can have an impact on regulating that. And they would, you know, either hire or convince those lobbyists to work on their behalf right? and those key influencers to work on their behalf to then um, communicate with and, and sort of uh, lobby and, and, and persuade those specific decision makers, people who can actually have an impact on um, the, the specific um, legislation or, or whatever that you're trying to um, to, to protect or to enact or to uh, reject or whatever it is you're trying to do. So it works that opposite than way in upward flow using, but, the, you know, again, in the middle of that, that's really that key influencers. You're not trying to convince everybody. You're trying to convince the people who can convince the people who need to be convinced. Uh, next one we can look at a spiral of si silence, a spiral of silence developed by Elizabeth Noel Newman. And uh, this, the spiral of silence has to do with the hesitation to voice opinions or ideas contrary to those in media, right? In the media. So when you've got the, the media or, or any group that's really, whether they're, they're the majority or minority, that's, that's really vocal and really loud and has the public ear for this, there's a hesitation for people to say, no, I disagree with that because you don't really want to be out on your own. There's this fear of isolation and rejection. Um, so it causes people to remain silent and to, to continue to become silent and to grow even more silent over time. So, um, for example, you know, just as a graphic representation, this idea of pop popular opinion, right? This level of popular opinion. And then there's a spiral below it that, that continues to become more and more silent as it, as it goes down. And, and uh, so your, your willingness to speak out goes down as public opinion popular opinion grows and becomes louder and louder and louder as people begin shouting it, whether again, even if it's a small percentage of the population, if they feel passionate about it, to reach that ability to, and the willingness to speak out, you've got to be right up there with popular opinion. You've got to be, you really have this, this, um, um, this sort of movement behind you where you feel like you're supported and you've got people, but when you're down here somewhere, when you, you're just an individual with a contrary opinion or idea, you begin that, that spiral down into silence, right? And eventually you get to that point where you just remain silent. It's just easier. It's safer to remain silent in these situations, right? Um, so um, when you're, when you're contrary to popular opinion and that popular opinion is being expressed loudly, again, not even necessarily the majority opinion, this could be a very vocal minority, but if you don't, if you don't sense or have an idea that there's a, a, a different majority behind you, then you are more likely to remain silent and to, to continue down in that spiral of silence. If you don't feel like there's, you know, if you, most people aren't willing to go it on their own. Right. So, um, so you develop the spiral of silence. So that's what we call diffusion of innovation. You can see the graph here that uh, diffusion of innovation, how ideas grow. This is brought to us by Everett Roberts. It's this process of a, a, to adoption of a product or idea. So, you know, we, we can look at things like um, it's easy to see in technology, for example. If we look back at the history of Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, all of those things follow this really, this where you have these innovators, these early people, really early people who, you know, are developing it and people are using it very, very early on. Those are your innovators, right? They, they strike out on their own, even when nobody else, you know, when there are five people using Twitter, they're out there using it. But then you eventually have these early adopters, some other people that come on board and say, this is, this is really kind of cool. Again, we can look at those key influencers that we talked about in the two-step flow theory, right? Those key influencers are the same early adopters. When you can get the right early adopters, then you can start to get people to say, oh, this is cool. So you start to get that early majority 
and your and your your usage and your popularity grows then it grows this popularity of this product or idea or whatever it is so this is when you know in the development of technology you get a good number of people using it oftentimes in that situation with technology i remember with facebook it was mostly you know it started with college students obviously and even the early majority when it expanded beyond college were still younger people eventually you, you start catching everybody else eventually i remember when my mom started using facebook when she was in her 70s and still does now and, she, and she's in her 80s now right but uh, so she would have been in that late majority she was a little later coming to facebook and understanding what it is but eventually it caught up where everybody was kind of on there then you get the laggards, the people who are really far behind and, and may not even adopt it at all. But if they do, it's going to be very, very late. And they'll be very late to the party. But, you know, really most ideas um, and and uh, of importance and, and products and things have this diffusion of innovation. So you got to focus on what stage you're at and be realistic with your intentions and, and how can you get from one stage to the next. Again, oftentimes as early adopters, it's important to to find those key influencers, people that can can reach others for you uh, and really start to expand them. But anyway, it's really interesting, this diffusion of innovation. So. There's also what we call uses and gratification theory. This is from Elihu Katz. Right? Elihu Katz said that uh, media users take an active role through media choices and utilization. Right? So based on their uh, user needs, these users make choices then that uh, will impact their their your utilization, and that's based on gratification in his estimation, right? So, so really, this starts with the user, and uh, and and the user then is going to have a variety of media options, as we know, especially in today's day and age, we have all kinds of ways that we can express ourselves and use the media and and choose which one best meets our needs for that situation. So in between there, Katz said, there are these different needs and these categories of needs, diversion, personal relationships, personal identity, and surveillance. Uh, basically knowing what's going on. Surveillance is essentially knowing what's happening in the world. So depending on which of these categories we're interested in satisfying and gratifying, uh, that will determine what option of media we're going to use. If I'm, if I'm just looking for a diversion, maybe I just flip on the TV and, and, and find something, you know, I start watching The Office or Parks and Rec, or I start watching some TV show that's, you know, that, that I enjoy, but it's still kind of mindless. I'm just looking for something to divert me. Uh, but if I'm looking for developing a personal relationship, and that's my that's my intention, that's my desire, my to find gratification in developing that personal relationship. Maybe I try and get my wife and our kids or, or whoever to play some Mario Kart with me or play a trivia game with me or, you know, watch TV that we can all show a while while watch together or something, you know, we'll binge watch something. If, if that's the whole point is to develop those relationships. So depending on the user need, what, what category or what, what specific, you know, um, itch they're trying to scratch that will determine which option of media that they'll use. And, and so our media options or media choices are then according to Katz's theory here, uh, determined by and influenced by our uh, gratification, what we're trying to gratify at that moment. So this is something called uh, Principles of Influence by uh, Robert Cialdini, right? Caldini said that people are more strongly influenced by particular cues when, when we are, um, when we encounter a leader who has particular, uh, particular cues, particular um, uh, skills, or particular, you know, represents particular things, um, that, but we're we're drawn to and influenced by particular cues, such as reciprocation, consistency, and commitment, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. These are all different cues that will influence more influence us more strongly than others. So, as public relations practitioners, it's uh, good for us to be able to identify. Okay, what is the um, the the principle that we can use maybe to reach and, and leverage that with the audience that we're dealing with. Inoculation theory, you know, one more we're going to look at here, inoculation theory by um, William McGuire basically says that inoculation builds resistance to persuasive messages, right? So, um, and we we receive that inoculation like a like when we receive a, a vaccine for uh, the flu or for whatever, for COVID, when you receive those vaccines, those small doses then build up a resistance to uh, the larger sickness by, by receiving the small doses of live virus. Right. So, um, so, but so the same idea is true in inoculation theory. Uh, McGuire says that um, counter opposition uh, arguments should be used in small doses. Right? When we, when we, when we counter those opposition arguments, when we, 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 take them in small bites, maybe even unexpectedly, but along the way, 
We, we counter those opposition arguments in small doses, just in small ways. And then that builds a natural resistance to later arguments. Even when we're not around and somebody hears a larger argument or a continuation of that, they've already got this built in. Oh, no, that's not correct, because I know I've heard this before. I've heard that counter argument before, and it starts to build that, even though it was a smaller dose, builds that larger resistance to the, to the broader idea. Okay. We've talked about a lot of different theories, and there's certainly more that we could talk about here. But the, the, the idea is that there are a lot of lot of ways that we can impact things using these theory. We can we can use these in our practice of public relations. Um, and so we need to identify what are some ways that we can use this theory to enhance our own practice. If you have questions about any of these theories or about how theory might uh, might prove useful in your practicing of public relations, please feel free to email me. I'd love to talk to you there. And in the meantime, I hope that um, you will um, really dig into these and other theories of communication that could impact public relations so that you can better utilize those in your own practice of public relations.